Take your copy of the biblical text and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. It's good to see you this evening. I'm thankful that you're here. I want us to think about the end and expectation of the end and how we're to live in expectation of the end. I've been listening to fellow Christians lately and they've been telling me that death is surrounding us. It's all around us. It's hit our homes. It's hit our congregation. We need to be sure that we are prepared to leave this earth, whether it be death or the coming of Christ that will mean the end. We are living in a time of global uncertainty. Our lives, our routines have changed over the last year and a half, and living through a pandemic such as we have is like sailing in unchartered waters on troubled seas. There's a saying, you cannot know the strength of your anchor until you have felt the power of the storm. As Christians, we need to understand that God is our immovable anchor. And His Word is the guide that will get us through any storm, like the lighthouse on the stormy seas, getting the sailors to their destination safely. That's what God and His Word are to us as Christians. We need to live every day in expectation of the end. We know the Lord is coming back. In 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. We need to be living in expectation of the end. It could come at any time. Expectation is a strong belief that something will happen. That we're convinced it will happen. That we're looking forward to it happening. That we're eagerly awaiting. I want us to look at 2 Peter chapter 3. This is the last inspired writing we have in the biblical text of the Apostle Peter. He's an aged apostle by this time, and he is certainly thinking about the end. And he writes, beginning in verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 3, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. First thing I want us to realize from this text is that the second coming of Christ will be mocked by the world, but it is a guarantee from God. It's a guarantee. It will happen. We need to understand that. We don't need to be surprised that some will scoff about the coming of Jesus. Some say that Christians have been talking about the second coming of our Lord for 2,000 years, and it hasn't happened yet. They willfully forget about God's creation and the judgment that God poured out on the world in the days of Noah. They forget about that. 
and they deny judgment and accountability to God. They say that Christians are foolish to believe this will happen. But it talks about, in there at the end of verse 7, the perdition of ungodly man. That's eternal punishment for ungodly people that are not living as they should. But we need to understand that the Lord is coming back. A true hope that we have in our life here is, is not to save ourselves from death. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. We're going to die. It's appointed to us all. And after that, the judgment. Or to save this planet as if that's going to happen. True hope is eternal life. An inheritance that Peter writes in his first letter, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, is an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade, fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So true hope is eternal life. God desires that we pay attention to the fact that the end of this life is coming. But He knows that many people won't. That they'll just think it's a joke. In fact, He references how it was in the days of Noah when he was talking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 24. Do you remember that? If you look at Matthew chapter 24, Jesus has been talking about, I think in this chapter, the, both the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of time. And in talking about the, this, we see in verses 37 and 38 of Matthew chapter 24 that Jesus says these words, But as the days of Noah were so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Just as in the days of Noah when he warned the people that the flood is coming and they mocked at him and made fun of him and just went about their lives like things were going to continue as they always were. We see the flood came. Noah entered the ark. Can you imagine as the waters began to rise, got higher and higher? I imagine those people were thinking twice and perhaps they stood at the ark and their fingernails scratching the gopher wood of the ark, wishing they had heeded the warning. Noah gave them plenty of time uh, to change their ways. He preached Righteousness for a long time, but they did not heed. They mocked. But there's an anchor that holds and that will help us through the troubled times. And it's the glorious promise to everyone that puts their faith in Jesus. Jesus is coming again. In John chapter 14 and verse 3, when he was preparing his disciples for his departure, he wanted them to be expecting this that he was going to be departing. But in order to comfort them, he says in John 14 and verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. People are convinced that life is going to continue as it always has. But we need to re remember as God's people and be aware that it will not, that there is an end that is coming and it is promised by God and God is faithful and God will keep His promise. Look in Hebrews chapter 6, a very familiar passage. In Hebrews chapter 6, talking about our anchor in the troubled times in this life. In Hebrews chapter 6 in verse 18, that by two immutable things, that's things that don't change, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of of Melchizedek. God has promised that the end is coming and we need to realize that this world is not our permanent place. 
It's not our permanent address that the end of time is coming, that we are to consider ourselves as pilgrims here on this earth, as sojourners. And Peter has tried to remind us in these letters that that's exactly what we are. If you look back to the letter of 1 Peter, who is it addressed to? It's addressed to the pilgrims of the dispersion. Christians that have spread because of the persecution of Christians. They are to live as pilgrims and he addresses them as such. And he uses these terms throughout this letter. That we are pilgrims and sojourners. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. It's a temporary place We need to be looking towards eternity. But the second thing I want us to understand from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 13, is that the timing of Christ's coming is in God's hand, and it is for His saving purposes. Only God knows the time. When has Jesus, when has Jesus promised to come? Well, we don't know the time, and it's not for us to know the time. But in this passage that we're looking at, it has quite a bit to say about time and how we regard time. If you look at uh, verse 8, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is, is a, as, a, as is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And then in verse 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but but that all should come to repentance. You know, I remember, and I know the young people have started back to school. I remember when I was young and going to school, I thought those days lasted forever, those school days. From the time that my mom dropped me off at the front of the school and then came to pick me up, it seemed like so long. And now the days just rush by. It's a short time. But you think about with God. God looks at time from a different perspective than we do. He looks at it with the backdrop of eternity because He is eternal. In the book of Daniel, He is referred to as the Ancient of Days. And you think about how as we age, time seems to go by quicker, doesn't it? Tomorrow, Lord willing, my sister, my baby sister will turn 50. I was contacting her today. We were texting back and forth. I said, enjoy the last day of your 40s. But your baby sister is turning 50. I remember when mom and dad brought her home from the hospital. Tommy and I were so disappointed that she was a girl. And now she's grown up. She's a woman and she's getting older. And she's my baby sister. The years fly by. The years fly by. You know, have you ever made a promise And then as time goes on, you kind of forget you made that promise. God don't forget the promises He makes. Even thousands of years go by. He remembers His promise. And He's going to keep His promise. And God guarantees that the end is coming. And He's going to do it in His time. His time. We need to be ready for it. God is patient with sinners, and I believe that this world still exists because God desires all people everywhere to turn from their sins and to turn in faith to Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son. God is patient, but He has made a promise. This should show us of the importance of being sure that we're right with God at every present moment. Being sure that if the end came at any moment, we would be ready to face God in judgment. Think about what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6 in verse 2. 2 Corinthians 6 in verse 2, he wrote, For he says, and that's God, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This day, August 15th, 2021, is the day of salvation. Now is the time. 
to obey the gospel. Now is the time to share the gospel with the lost. Now is the time for people everywhere to come to the Lord in faith and obedience. Now is the time for us to teach the word of God to anyone who is willing to listen. Now is the time to call the world to repent of their sins and be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. The timing of Christ's coming is in the hand of God. We don't know when that is, so we need to be ready at every moment. The third point I want us to consider, thinking about verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 3, is that the material world will be destroyed. And I think the Apostle Peter, in inspiration, makes this point very clear that the coming of Christ is coming and this world will be destroyed. It will be something that should not catch us off guard. But it will catch many off guard. To those that are not Christians, to those that are scoffers, to those that are mocking at the idea of the second coming of Christ, it will be a shock to them. It will come like a thief in the night. And the wicked will be surprised when Christ comes to take the saved to heaven. You think about the first coming of Christ, the Messiah, being born of a virgin and living among men. He came in a very humble manner. But the second coming is described as him coming with power and great glory. Christ is coming to judge the world in righteousness. He will put an end to death, the last enemy. Every Christian we see in the New Testament was longing for the coming of Christ. You think about these, Peter, these people to whom Peter was writing in the first letter as pilgrims that have left their homes and gone places because of the persecution of Christians. You think about that and how they were thankful of the fact that there was something better waiting them. I'm afraid sometimes that we have it so good here on this earth that we don't give enough longing and expectation to the coming of Christ and how wonderful it will be. In the book of Revelation, John wrote that from an island in the Aegean Sea. We see that he was all alone. He had witnessed many of his fellow Christians and apostles killed for the cause of Christ. And he's been abandoned and he's feeling all alone. And I want you to notice how the biblical text ends in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20. He quotes Jesus. He says, he who testifies to these things says, and this is a quote of Jesus, surely I am coming quickly. And John adds, Amen, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Do you think that he was ready? Do you think that he was longing for the... Do you think his return could have been too quickly for him? No. He lived in a world where Christians were being persecuted. It was difficult to be a Christian. All kinds of wickedness going on. He was ready for the Lord to come. I'm afraid too often times we get too attached to this world. And we spend too much of our time, far too much of our time, concerned with things and, and giving resources to things that will be burned up and do not matter. If we truly grasp the fact that this world is going to be destroyed with fire, it won't be destroyed with water. The, the rainbow, well, which has been distorted by our sinful and wicked world, is given by God as a sign that this world will not be flooded again as it was in Genesis chapter 6. It's a promise from God. It's going to be destroyed with the fire. And you talk about global warming. That's what I believe about global warming. Is it's coming. And it's going to be melted with a fervent heat, this world. So why do we care so much about the material things that we have? We need to be laying up our treasures in heaven where they will never be destroyed. If we truly are living in expectation of the coming, we will not place too much of our time and effort 
and longing for this material world in which we live. But the last point in this lesson, God expects us to live a life of holiness in expectation of Christ's return. God expects us to live a life of holiness in expectation of the Lord's return. How should Christians live in these troubled times? How do we prepare for the coming of Christ? He says here, we live a life of holiness and godliness. We are called to live differently from the world. We're not to be conformed to it, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We're not to be of this world. We look forward to the coming of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 31, Paul makes the statement that I die daily. What do you think that means? I die daily. I think Paul is talking about sin and this world. He dies to that on a daily basis. You know, sin in this world continually vie for our attention and they beg for our uh, participation. But we need to die to sin. And Paul addresses that in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. We need to die to ourselves. Paul says that he did in Galatians 2 and verse 20. One day Jesus, he will wrap up the current heavens and earth and destroy them like an old shabby garment to be burned. Look in Hebrews chapter 1. I love the beginning of this letter to the Hebrews. Talking about the superiority of Christ and it starts out God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son through whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom all he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he goes on to talk about how Jesus is superior to the angels. A lot of people in the first century were worshiping angels. And the writer of this letter says that Jesus is superior to those angels. He, but he does talk about the work of angels and he talks about what the, the Lord is going to do. Look at verse 10. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will fold them up and they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will not fail. Yes, this earth will be destroyed. And we need to be mindful of that. But God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It says that later in this letter. His years will not fail. He will last. And we need to put our trust in Him who will last forever. He is eternal. You think about the contrast between this life and heaven. And I enjoy coming here to worship and I look forward to the times that we assemble to worship God. There's nowhere I'd rather be than right here. I feel like I'm getting a taste of heaven, but it's only a taste of heaven. Heaven is described in such a wonderful way. And one of the most beautiful things I think is in this passage that sometimes we overlook. If you look at the final words in the passage that I read there in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, a place where righteousness dwells. We will never be tempted again. Satan will not be in heaven. Evil and wickedness and sin will not be in heaven. It is a place where righteousness dwells. Do you hunger and thirst after that righteousness? Then you should hunger and thirst for heaven. It should be on your mind on a daily basis. You get tired of this sin-sick world in which we live and all the evil of it. Are you ready to go home? Can you say with John, Lord, come quickly. I'm ready. You know, I struggle when we lose a brother and sister in Christ. We miss them dearly. But don't we trust that they're better off? 
they're better off than we are. And if we really are looking for their best interest, we would not want them to leave where they are and come back to this sin-sick world in which we live. We can go to a place where God is and there's no tears, there's no sorrow, there's no more death, there's no disease. It's a perfect environment, a perfect economy. There's no need for the sun or the moon because God is its light. The joys of heaven are difficult for us to grasp. In Revelation 21 and verse 3, John wrote, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. If we truly grasp that the end is coming, we will live holy lives before our God. We will put away from sin from our lives. We will strive to live as pleases our God. Peter touches on this often. If you go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and remember what he says in verse 14 beginning as obedient children not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance but as he who called you is holy you also be holy in all your how are you to conduct yourself in light of the fact that you know the Lord is coming and you don't know when you live holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, verse 16, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We sang a song this morning, Lamb of God, Lamb of God. He shed his precious blood so that we can be redeemed and live with the hope of heaven. If we are holy... As God is holy, we appreciate the sacrifice that was made for our sins, the sacrifice that can save us, and that is the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we appreciate the incorruptible word, which it goes on to talk about, that word of the Lord that endures forever. And then in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul Peter goes on to say, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, we are sojourners and pilgrims. And in realizing that we are sojourners and pilgrims, we abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having our conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. That day of visitation is the day that the Lord is coming back. And the way that we can glorify Him is to live in a way that others see our good works and that we abstain from fleshly lust and they want to be like that so they're converted to Christ and God will be glorified in the day of visitation. We need to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, it says in verse 21 of chapter 2. We need to be a good example for our spouses that we might win them if they're unbelievers. And we need to be ready to give an answer to a defense if anyone that asks us a reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear, chapter 3 and verse 15, we need to live in a way that pleases God and be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That is how we are to live, a life of holiness and expectation of Christ's return, and God expects us to. Are you living that way? I believe all of us here would readily say, yes, I believe the Lord is coming again. I believe it with all my heart. I believe in the promises of God. God does not lie. I put my anchor, he's my anchor of hope. I trust him completely. But yet we can say it all day long, but how is it affecting our lives? Are we living in expectation 
of the end? Are we like the scoffers that just go about life like it's going to last forever? In James chapter 4, James, the half-brother of Jesus, says life is like a vapor. It appears for a little while, and then it's gone. It dissipates. Life is like that. If the Lord wills, we can do this or that. Don't make plans without the Lord. Make all your plans with the Lord. Trust in Him completely. Be sure that you're ready now. Today is the day of your salvation, not tomorrow. Today is. Do something about it now if you need to, to be right with God. Come while together we stand and sing.